once they've started the journey, there's this momentum, this forward momentum where you can kind of picture where this is going to go. Right, this excitement. Yeah. Neo decides to take the, the blue pill. He yeah, learns so. about the Matrix. He is starting to get good at it. He understands the rules of the world. Yeah. Suddenly, pinch point one hits, and he finds out that if you die in the Matrix, you die in real life. And it's suddenly like, oh, fuck, this isn't as fun as I thought it was. Right. Welcome back to the Burning Boat Show. On this week's episode, we do part two of story structure when it comes to writing a screenplay. Yeah. Um, we did a part one and we felt like we could not possibly fit everything in our big brains into yeah. just one episode, so we split it into two. Yeah. It's a little bit, we should say, it's a little bit all over the place when we're talking about this stuff because we do have kind of guides in front of us. When you're going through, I think it would be helpful to if you're on a computer, open up Blake Snyder's, what's it called? 15 point story structure or something. Yeah, as well as Sid Field's three act structure. Yeah, if just you, so just, you, if you want it to be a little bit less confusing. We'll, we'll, yeah. yeah. We get into a lot of things. We talk a lot about the midpoint, the all is lost moment in films. We talk about the B story. Yeah. We talk about character arcs, positive change arcs, negative change arcs, flat arcs. We get into a lot of good stuff, so if that's something you're into, keep watching. If not, there's plenty of other episodes that you might be more interested in. Bye. B. And he's and the guy's torturing with the Beethoven music, and then he jumps out the window and tries to kill himself because he can't handle it. Yeah, I mean that sounds right. like an all his last moment. Yeah. The the window, right? Yeah, probably. I, I, or I, is it when he first gets to the house and we're like, oh fuck, there's like you're fucked. Because then you have the no, that's the, the three. bad guys closing in. That's when I've, all those external forces are closing in around him. Right. Just from hearing you talk about it, okay. I, I don't remember. All is lost, and then there's. I guess it just doesn't have a dark night of the soul. I mean, then it maybe. Well, isn't he in the hospital? hospital? Yeah, but he's pretty happy in the hospital. Is he? Mm-hmm. Okay. I, thought, I remember that being quite creepy, though. The doctors no, are like asking him things, and he's all like, "It's he's in the hospital. He's getting like interviewed. He's out of the situation. Mm -hmm. He's really like." smug okay and then although maybe that's towards the very end then maybe that's a longer scene but then in the end he's like we zoom up into his thoughts and he's having a massive orgy he's like says something like oh i was cured all right well if you weren't cued into that conversation we were just having that we're talking about story on this week's podcast uh you're slow we're this is you're part, slow this is part two not you i'm talking Who are you to people calling slow to. Talk, talking to the people listening. Oh, um, that's what we're that's what we're talking about on this week's episode of the Burning Boat Show. Yes, we did a part one a few weeks ago, and we're doing part two because we didn't get through everything we wanted to talk about. Correct. And we tried part two. To be completely honest, we tried part two yesterday, and I basically fell asleep during the podcast. So right. we're doing it again because it was not a good. Maybe we'll release that on Patreon. Maybe. How about that? Nah. <laughs> um. I think that's a great idea. Um, so, Robin, where did we leave off on the podcast prior? So, last week you were talking about, or the last one, um, you were talking about uh, the different Aaron Sorkin uh, quotes. Oh, yeah. And then okay. after that, you went on to talk about um, the idea of trust. So, it's stilling trust in your audience. Okay. Mm. And then... You went on. To oh, how like quickly you can use uh, lose trust? Yeah. yeah. If there's something unbelievable yeah. Yeah. that happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you talked about confusion as well. So tactically. Ah, if it's confusing, you should address it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be actually confusing. Yeah. Um, Very rarely. It can be confusing, just yeah. the character has to be confused. Mm -hmm. I'd yeah, say exactly. That yeah. The last bit was probably the trust. Uh, you did talk about Boris and Johan as well, but that was just on more of a general level okay so i'd say trust was where you left off trust yeah okay well let's move forward with structure yeah i like when you do it you're very good i think at talking through it i think you 
overall are a little bit more clear on all of this. I kind of realized in the podcast yesterday mm. that I've spent so much time thinking about act one. Yeah. That as soon as I got into act two, just not where I am in my script right yeah, now, yeah. I was like, yeah, I haven't like really dived into this yet. Yeah, I think that's a common thing actually uh, for a lot of writers of any kind is that so much time is spent on act one purely because it comes chronologically first. Yeah. And I at least have rewritten my act one for both the f scripts I've written like so many times. Yeah. And once you get into act two, the amount of rewriting you do is a lot less just because you realize that the task is to get to the end rather than to constantly be rewriting. Yeah. And I think a good place to start would be by addressing the fact that within the three act structure, Act one and act two, uh, sorry, act one and act three are significantly shorter than act two. Act two is the bulk of your movie. Yes. If you split it into quarters, you could say that act one is one quarter, act two is two quarters, and act three is the final quarter. Yeah. And often what happens uh, is writers struggle to get from the beginning of act two to the end of act two because it's such a long stretch in the writing process. Yeah. We're talking about like 60 pages before you get to another clear plot point. And we talked about plot points on last week's uh, or on the previous week's podcast. Um, but just to remind you kind of of what those points represent, they're a point in the, stru in, the, in the structure of the film where the character makes a decision that takes the story into a new direction. Yeah. Specifically something that they decide to do. It's not something that happens to them we're watching this film because of the character and we're in their perspective for most of the time. And so it's important that it's something that they are deciding to do. Um, and so uh, an important thing that uh, Sid Field in his book, the screenplay, I believe it's called, talks about is the how important the midpoint is. The midpoint of the story is kind of another, it's not really a plot point because it doesn't quite follow the rules that I just laid out, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a point right bang in the middle of the story that you can kind of set your sights on when you're starting to write act two. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways to look at it, but two of my favorite kind of descriptions of what the midpoint can represent are that it's a point in the story where the stakes are raised. Yeah. It's the midpoint. And I think a great example is for, is in Jurassic park, the first Jurassic park where right in the middle of the film exactly halfway through almost to the minute yeah the t-rex breaks through the gate yeah uh, through the fence sorry and suddenly you realize holy shit like stuff just got real serious real quick yeah and it you know gives the second half of the film a lot more of a sense of urgency the stakes are definitely raised i've also heard it be talked about as a point at which the main character, the hero of your story, either experiences a false peak or a false defeat. Yeah. Which in a way also raises the stakes. Is it another way of saying they get what they want, but there's a price for it basically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've also heard that. There's a lot of different phrasings about yeah. it, but I think it's important to to think about just how useful a midpoint can be. Sorry, I, I thought that was the dog. No, no, no. It's just my clammy feet. Okay, thank you. It's very hot. We have to close the windows for good sound. So while the podcast goes on, we're yeah. drinking hot coffee. Hot coffee. In a hot room and we get real nice and sweaty. Yeah. With a light pointing right at us. Am I? I'm all right right now. Light gray is okay. Ah, you're all right. Yeah, okay. They get, you said they get what they want, but there's a price for it yeah or they don't get they what they pay, want yeah and they <laughs> don't pay a price for it they get a prize <laughs> well let's look at a couple more examples because i think that really helps uh, like give some context to some of these more yeah. like abstract concepts yeah so we were looking last week at the matrix and castaway okay and we were talking about what what is the what is the midpoint in castaway and i think we came to the conclusion that it's got to be spoiler alert um, the point at which suddenly the film uh, cuts the black and then text appears on the screen and it says four years later. Yeah. Suddenly you're like, holy shit, what? Four yeah. years just passed like that? Yeah. 
Whereas up until that point, it has been very chronological. Yeah. You've been living with this character, you know, real time, practically. Yeah. And so the fact that it says four years later feels very much like, oh my God, like this is kind of like going in a different direction than I thought it was. Yeah. The stakes are suddenly, I don't even think, think they're raised. The stakes are like totally different. Yeah, it suddenly changes. Totally changes. Your whole mindset when you're watching the film. I mean, he wants to get off the island. And now you're like, getting off the island means so much more now. After four years. Yeah, suddenly, it's not going to be the same when you come back. Is that, that, is that, that even what yeah, he wants? Yeah, you know? yeah. You think about what's what's waiting for him back home. Mm-hmm. If there is there even a home to return to? Like, yeah, what everything's the fuck changed. Is, yeah. Everything's changed. Which then allows you more space for writing. Now you have a new mm. kind of lens to look through. Yeah. Something new, something interesting to keep the viewer interested as well. That's a good way of looking at yeah. it. That's ultimately the goal is it to... opens another door. Drive the story consistently forward. You can't yeah. linger too long on any one thing. Yeah. And that same rule uh, boils down to just a single scene as well. Yeah. We've got this, like, I don't know if this is being caught on camera here, but there's a triangle. If not, Robin can throw it up on... on uh, on the screen. screen, which talks about how every scene needs to start, you know, wherever the scene starts, yeah. and boil down to a singular point, yeah. and that point is what drives the story to the next scene, exactly, and drives the entire story forward. And you get a feeling of um, momentum in the story, yeah. You know that this this should be happening. This makes sense to be happening. Mm. Oh, I'm suddenly remembering. It's uh, the same with the camera. I mean, you start with the wide shot, yeah. and a lot of times you focus into a single exactly. thing, a close up. A gun in someone's back pocket. Yeah, I mean, we're talking very. Like, and then we cut to the next scene, here. right? We just saw the gun. Yeah, I'm thinking about the gun now. Right. Suddenly, the scene has a lot more like, oh fuck! Now he's in this lawyer's office. What's he gonna do with the gun? I just got this little piece of information. Right. I um I was in one of the many screenplay books that we're talking about. There was an example of take a story for like a story that's about a road trip, for example, mm-hmm. and. A lot of uh, beginner writers will want to write a story that reflects an experience they've had. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't? I mean, I don't think any writer really writes about something that they haven't had some kind of experience with to begin with. But let's say they've been on a road trip and they want to write a screenplay about like all the th- crazy things that happened on yeah. that road trip. And so that's what they do. They write about you know going to see the... You've been on a road trip. What are some of the crazy things you saw on your road trip? Oh, we saw many things. We saw canyons. We saw arches. Like, what is there any like? Could you picture a specific scene taking place in any one of those locations? Like something where something crazy happened, or you met some interesting people, or yeah. Well, let's imagine you had an actually exciting road trip, um, yeah. and uh, you want to write a story about that. A lot of writers will struggle to have this idea of momentum that you were right. talking about because it'll just Did you be... want an example from me sorry <laughs> yeah i was hoping that maybe you okay because I, I was about to like make up shit like i have the an biggest uh, cheese ball in the world yeah. or like uh we were we were driving yeah i, I think in colorado and a snowstorm hit mm. quite early on we had like a couple hours left mm-hmm. and then uh we pulled over and we're like oh shit the windshield wipers are freezing mm. and i was driving at the time and i was also in a, kind of having a fight with kevin we were just a little bit had been in the car too long with each other and then slowly i just can't see anything anymore it gets more and more frozen and we're like wiping the window from the outside um because n- none of the windshield wiper fluid was coming out anymore uh-huh. it's frozen mm-hmm. so i said oh i gotta put antifreeze in the windshield wiper so we go to the gas station uh and the hood is shut fr- uh it's froze shut frozen shut and then we just had to leave you just had to leave the car we no, we put chains on the car and we just kept driving but and we would anything. take the antifreeze and we would pour it from the side right. over the window as we're going very scary experience i saw a car slide across the entire highway and i was like there goes that guy and I slowly trottled home that's a great example of something that could totally be a scene in a larger film yeah and imagine let's say you have like four or five other examples like yeah, that yeah, yeah where this is really going to be what the bulk of your act two is going to be about say yeah. writing a screenplay about this yeah. road trip i think a lot of um writers would struggle to string them together in some kind of meaningful way and it would end up feeling very much like isolated scenes that by themselves if you watch yeah. them alone great interesting there's yeah. conflict 
but there's not that feeling of it leading to the next scene. Yeah. And as soon as you said the fact that you were you were having like a fight with Kevin or something. Yeah. Let's say that maybe the whole screenplay is actually about your relationship with Kevin. Yeah. And that, well, I don't know what what in real life exactly it would be, but let's pretend like by the end, you, or by the beginning you're not friends, and at the end you are friends. And yeah, or you're friends, and then it's bumpy, and then exactly. you come out, and it's like oh, closer than ever. And so a scene like that would need to be about, you know, the, the this frozen situation. Yeah. But boil to a point at which part of your relationship is revealed right. or is taken to the next step. Right. Uh, and so that you can get to the next scene. And yes. then it would build on from there. Um, so, yeah, what you were saying about momentum and that yeah. scene leading to the next thing. I think it's hard to do. Yeah, and one is. thing I had found a little bit helpful when I was writing Boris and Johan was actually going in reverse at times. Huh. that I would find a point I wanted to end up in and kind of just see logically what the steps were mm, to, get, to there. get me there. That's good. I think that's exactly what a lot of these points are, are meant to be, that mm. you can kind of go through and say, okay, I know what my film is about. Yeah. Uh, as in, I know the themes. I know yeah. my character. I know roughly what I want to have happen at the end. Yeah. How can I like start to structure it before I start writing it so that I have these points that I can hit and so that I yeah. can start writing knowing that I'm going to get to here yeah. and so that I can set it up to lead there in a natural, believable, interesting, yeah, exciting way. Exciting, I think, is yeah, is the main point there. So because, if you kn- Go ahead. No, 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 I wasn't really going to say anything. Oh. I think intuitively, when I first, like years ago, when I was thinking about writing films, I, in my head, the fun and games... You know, here it says it's page 30 to 55. I think I used to think it was like page 30 to 70. Right. You know, that's it. You get into act two, you have a bunch of fun and games. It all leads up to mm. this climactic moment yeah. and the movie's done. Right. You know, and I think that's how intuitively I would have, Boris and Jan is a little bit like that. You know, it's just, it sits too long in the first part of act two. Mm. And is, you know, things like the B story, which we'll get to and everything, just kind of adds that, extra layer that allows you to have more conflict more excitement in this story um, yeah, it gets you to ask really a bit good less questions as well because it's not just like and this and this and this yeah. and this and this and here's the climax it kind of i don't know at least for me like yeah. i don't even recognize the structure in a story i'm just kind right. of like watching the movie then yeah you know it's, it's it takes a it takes a lot of effort to actually like analyze a yeah. film and look at it, especially for me i feel like films just wash over me yeah. i really have to sit there like in a different way if i want to be analyzing it um taylor's referring to a 15 point uh story structure that um the writer of save the cat has kind of said is a really good way to he say the uh his name is blake snyder blake snyder yeah that's a really good book that i would recommend for anyone yeah wanting to know more about uh, writing scripts. And we'll go through that in a second, but but the um, the fun and games and the B story that you mentioned are two of those points yeah. of the 15 point structure. Yeah. Um, what was, I was I was gonna say something um, about the... We're talking about like writing in reverse? Yeah, writing in reverse that like if you have, say you, yeah, yeah, with the midpoint, mm-hmm. you can kind of say it forces you to ask yourself really interesting questions about what could happen in this story. Yeah. Like, how can I get to a point halfway through the story where my main character suddenly learns something that they didn't know about? Yeah. That really, like, spins everything in a new way. And um, a good example of that is in The Matrix. Um, in The Matrix, uh, again, spoiler alert for all of this stuff, uh, Neo is believed... Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, is believed to be the one, the the savior, the mm-hmm. the, the messiah in a, in a lot of ways. They refer to him as the one. And exactly halfway through, at the midpoint, he is he goes to the Oracle within the Matrix, and the yeah. Oracle is this being who is all knowing and knows the future, knows everything that's going to happen. Yeah. And she tells him point blank that he's not the one. And so it's like shocking what the hell like everything has been leading up to this yeah. you know morpheus is totally set on neo being the one everyone believes that neo is the one yeah and so now he has to suddenly deal with this news that he's not the one and it becomes more about like well what is he gonna how is he gonna tell them that how is he yeah. gonna 
he can't save the world he can't do the thing that he's meant to do and and so it's it's totally different although the plot can still continue in the yeah. way it's going you're suddenly thinking about all the scenes and specifically his experience in a totally different light in a way it offsets the thing that we as the audience want to see and mm. almost makes it more satisfying when we do see it then mm. you know it's like withholding it a little bit yeah you were saying that it's in our in our uh, previous previous episode that'll be on Patreon. Yeah, um, no. you can, <laughs> if you want to see me sleep for sixty minutes, um, I talked a lot on that uh, episode. You you were saying that it's almost like you get a piece of information. The character yeah. gets a piece of information that they didn't know. Yeah, I think that's that's probably uh, true. In some I thought that I thought that was, well. good, uh, was a good a uh, good good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, but let's let's move on because there's some more interesting story points within Sid Field's uh, three act structure. Yeah, let's do the B story. I think the B story is quite interesting. No, oh, that's Sid, that's uh, Blake Snyder. Oh, sorry. I wanted sorry, to get sorry. into pinch points real quick. Oh, okay, go ahead. What are pinch points? Uh, I'll let you take that. Ah, I feel like you're better at no, it. No, no, come on. Let's give it. Let's give it a go. Pinch points. So just to recap, we've got Act One, Act Two, Act Three. Within Act One, you've got your inciting incident, your catalyst. Yeah. The thing that happens that without it, there would be no story. Exactly. It's the thing that forces the character to have to really think about well, what the hell are they going to do. And at point, uh, break into Act Two, plot point one, yeah. the character makes the decision basically to, you know, obviously there is a film. So they, they, make they go on the journey. They go on the journey, yeah. whatever that journey might yeah. be. Which leads us to the midpoint, which we just went over. Yeah, the where stakes are raised. Stakes are raised. Then we get to some sort of reversal, potentially. Mm -hmm. We get to the break into Act Three. Act Three being the final act. Yeah, where the resolution is going to happen, uh, where the decision makes another decision. Okay, the character. The character makes yeah. another decision that leads us into that act. Yeah, um, which contains both the all is lost moment and the climax, which we'll get to. Yeah, but with in act two so just backtracking a little bit yeah kind of sandwiching the middle point the midpoint are two pinch points yeah referred to as pinch points equidistant from the midpoint to act one and act three we'll throw up a, a little graph on the screen for those yeah. of you watching on youtube yeah. for you, so you can follow because it's really not that complicated when you see it kind of laid out on yeah. a timeline and maybe a little bit difficult to follow so i yeah i apologize but what what's a pinch point I honestly don't know. I think it's like the first kind of, I mean, I would imagine it's the first time the character is kind of in a pinch point in a, at right. a you know, there's conflict, there's confrontation. Something is going against what the character yeah, wants. Yeah, it's kind of the first time something negative happens Yeah, since starting the journey. Yeah. So you can't just, once they started the journey, there's this momentum, this forward momentum where you can kind of picture where this is going to go. Right. This excitement. Yeah. Uh, Neo decides to take the the blue pill. He yeah. learns about the Matrix. He is starting to get good at it. He understands the rules of the world. Yeah. Suddenly, pinch point one hits, and he finds out that if you die in the Matrix, you die in real life. Right. And it's suddenly like, oh fuck, this isn't as fun as I thought it was. Right. Like, that's pretty serious. Right. It's it's a pinch point. That makes sense. It's like a it's a negative. It's a dip. Mm. and it forces the character to have to like well they can't you, you, you can't just have a story that is constantly moving upwards no you have to have these waves yeah so all of these are kind of ways to create those waves yeah and the way that you apply these guidelines is totally infinite and there's so many ways you can do it um and pinch point two is the exact same thing just in the second half of act two and to use the matrix as an example Pinch point two is when Morpheus is captured by the agents. By the Asians? <laughs> yeah. By the agents. Thing. Yeah. By Agent Smith and his okay. merry gang of yeah. agents. A agents. Um, and it's like a moment of like, oh, fuck, our, our leader has been captured by the bad guys. Yeah. And yeah. it really feels like there's no way out of it. Which, you know, perfectly sets Neo up to be able to make the decision. Well, no, we're going to go save him. Yeah. And that's the break into Act 3. Yeah. That's the point where the main character makes a super crucial decision that leads us into the final climax, which is a rescue mission, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So I feel like those are just very neat pinch points and they're very easy to like digest from that film. Often they're hard to like identify. Yeah, because there might be a couple or something, but that that makes sense. Um, What would you say... Do we were we talking about castle and pinch points last time? Yeah. What are some pinch points there? I mean, I think the hmm. well. So he gets on the island. He starts to kind of like scramble around yeah. and like try to figure out what the fuck he should do. He finds some coconuts. He finds some packages. He's got his little yeah. uh, roof where he's not constantly in the sun. Starting a fire. Yeah, he builds a fire. I Actually, think we said that. Oh, sorry. Do you think that's the pinch point? No, the fire is... um, The fire is an interesting one because that's such a high. I don't think those are pinch points, though. No, no, no. Not at all. I'm saying that a pinch point is probably when he tries to escape the island for the first time and is washed back on shore and really injures himself. Yeah. So in a way, things are kind of going well for him before then. He's finding food. He's finding shelter. Just because there's conflict doesn't mean it's still not part of the like fun and games of it all, you know? Let's explain what this term fun and games is. Oh, okay. Because I think that might be a little confusing because it's obviously not fun for him. No. Fun and games is a, is a term that sometimes used to describe the, um, the segment right after plot point one where it feels like the story's really beginning. Like now we're on the journey. Yeah. This is what the premise of the film it's is. It's part of, of the premise. It d- delivers on the premise of exactly. the film. I think that's a good way of looking at it. A boy finds out he's a wizard and goes to a wizard, a wizard school, school called Hogwarts. Exactly. And this is the part where he goes to Hogwarts. And we find out what it's like to be a wizard. Yeah. What's the magic? What are, what are they capable when of Guardian doing? Wingardium Leviosa. All L- those things. Lumos. Um, Swish and Flick. Cast away, you know, he gets on the island. He, he starts surviving on exactly. the island. It's, it's the thing we're expecting to see in the movie. Yeah. You know? Um, I think on a previous episode, we talked about a log line being uh, basically a way to explain what a film is about to a complete stranger in a single yeah. line or two sentences yeah. or whatever. Uh, it's basically the, the, the part of the log line that you want to see. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It's the uh, a a bride who was uh, someone tried to murder a bride on her wedding day and left her for dead and now she's going back to everyone involved to have her revenge right Kill Bill good idea for a Quentin movie Tarantino um, or like any the fun and games is her starting to have her classic fucking revenge classic story right? is like a hero going out on a journey Lord and of the as Rings. soon as they leave for the journey act two starts and yeah. the thing is like we said, there's a lot of excitement involved in Act 2, but you have to break that excitement at one point, and obviously the hero has to find himself in a pickle. some sort of pickle or, or a pinch. <laughs> Call it a pinch. Ooh, nice. Um, that was good. But like- then I think the point we were trying to make is that there's a difference between Tom Hanks struggling to open a coconut and him cutting his leg on the waves when he's trying to yes, escape the island. Yes, 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 because he's making progress in the other one. Yeah, and him, it still him- feels, you know... The, yeah, exactly. He's making progress. Mm-hmm. He's getting somewhere. He is. And there, suddenly, we find out it's not easy to get off this it's island. It's not as easy as you thought. And it's actually really dangerous. And he's hurt himself. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. Can now he, he can heal now, his leg? Yeah. Suddenly, more urgency. Yeah. Because you kind of know in the back of your head that someone can survive for a really long time on yeah. just water. Yeah. So you know that there's like, okay, well, he's not about to die. But when he has, when he gets that cut, there's a feeling of like, oh, shit. Yeah, the progress That's pretty serious. You know, yeah. For a second, we have to go like, oh. So that is anything else on the fun and games? Well, why don't we go through this? These all these points. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So I find the the B story really interesting. Um, which here is point seven, which means the B story story is kind of introduced. Um, right after the break into Act Two, and the. B story is a, a a secondary element or another bit of information that will ultimately end up influencing the final part of the film. Does that make sense? A lot it's of times a it's, a, it's a love story, so it's like the hero you know the plot is that the hero needs to rob the bank or whatever and then there's suddenly we are introduced to this 
woman who, or a man who the hero has a crush on or whatever yeah and this love interest will ultimately reach a peak in the climax when he's robbing the bank and now he has to decide between yeah. the money and the person he loves or something um i think the b story is crucial when it comes to the character's need yeah it, re it reveals the hmm you know you've got the a story which is the plot the want the we need to get the mount doom yeah we need to you know destroy the matrix we yeah need to you know whatever yeah uh, murder everyone in revenge uh, and the b story is actually the well what's this all about like what's the real kind of what's the underlying thing that right. this character is going to learn what's the real message behind all this right that's the b story and that doesn't mean the b story can't be introduced in act one it, that, that's often yeah. part of the setup but the b story has a really prominent section in a story that comes kind of right after a break into act two. Yeah. And that's where you've got the full setup. You kind of get the premise. Yeah. You know, kind of where we're headed. Yeah. Now there's room to like take in something and that's a little bit new. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you can also have more than you can have B, C, D stories. Although what would you, what would you label like Lord of the Rings? The B story in Lord of the Rings? Yeah. I would say it's probably the re relationships between all the different characters. Which obviously you set that up here, but at the B story, you really start to get introduced to a lot of new characters as well. Yeah. Like Boromir and Legolas and Gimli when they're in Rivendell. Right. But their their story is the B story or their relationship is the B story? Yeah. The relationship and like their involvement in this as well. You know, it's not just about the hobbits. It's right. about this whole world. Yeah. All that's these right. different characters inhabit the world. There's like multiple just, stories yeah. that all come to a peak at the end. I think Lord of the Rings is a... You know, a huge example because yeah. there's so many it's such an epic piece yeah physically like, lengthwise uh, as well yeah you know it's a three part f essentially it's a story that's told over three parts and each of those parts is like three yeah. or four hours long so you've got a lot more room for i think saying it's the characters it, it reveals the characters need is really interesting yeah just thinking I think it makes sense yeah it does because it's the thing that kind of col not collides but interacts with the want at some point Right, and you get yeah. to see. Yeah, well, there's the, a crucial point later in the film yeah. where the A story and the B story cross. Exactly, which you were kind of getting at with the fact that there's going to be a scene in the climax where you know the love interest is, you know, Otherwise, somehow in jeopardy. Or yeah, exactly. Or, you know, the bad guy takes them hostage. Exactly. Or there's some in some way involved. I mean, perfect example: The Matrix. The B story is his romantic interest in Trinity. He's a huge character in the film and and in the climax. He has to rescue her. You know, it's an obvious crossing of the two mm -hmm. stories. But I mean, in in the uh, the last episode here that we keep referring to, that'll be on Patreon. Um, we talked about all of the different points, kind of in chronological order. It felt a little bit like confusing and overwhelming to go through it like that. But we were what we're gonna do. I think the thing to do is just look it up. Yeah, and you can see all the points. Yeah, um, for yourself. Again, this is Sid Fields. Now, this is Blake Snyder's paradigm from Save the Cat. Save the Cat. Real quick, let me just read them out so All you right. have them. You've got the opening image. Pretty easy to understand what that is. First image we see, which often very thematic, sets up the kind of mood. Yeah. That, what, what is is it a horror film? Is this a comedy? Is this yeah. a, what, what are we? What are In we, Castaway, we happening? see I think a four way road that's completely empty, and we kind of know it's going to have to do with isolation, or you know, mm. it cues you in nice um then we've got the theme stated which is a funny one i i really thought this was good when i when i started looking into this that there's often like he he quotes it as being on page five of a script yeah obviously that's just you know yeah these are all a, guidelines this is just an average yeah it can be on page eight it can be on page two it can yeah. be you know but in the beginning of the story yeah. there's a often a, a a minor character straight up states what the theme of the film is we'll say very directly this film is about good versus evil or you know, whatever right. um, and it's often not noticed by the main character and often not really like a, a huge moment where we're like oh this is what it's about but it's right. in there and I think it's so important to note that that early on you kind of 
are given this piece of information. Mm. Then you've got the setup, which is, you know, obviously we're setting up the story. Who are the characters? Where are they? Yeah, the um, beginning of the story. When is Act it taking one. place? Then we've got point four, which is the catalyst or the inciting incident, mm -hmm. the thing that changes everything. Then we've got the debate, which is a section of the screenplay where we're kind of, like we mentioned earlier, you're, you're debating what to do about the the yeah. thing that happened earlier the catalyst a lot of times the hero will be called to an adventure and the hero needs um time to decide to go on that adventure yeah that, that at first they refuse to go on the adventure but then they're ultimately led to a choice and they choose to go on to the adventure i i immediately think of castaway there because obviously they're not choosing to to be in a plane crash that's something that happens yeah. to them and there's this kind of limbo part of the film where he's floating around on the ocean. He well, at first he's escaping the plane, yeah. then he's floating around the ocean, then he kind of lands on the on island, rock. He's washed yeah. up. And there's a very clear point at which he gets up and he starts gathering supplies. Yeah, like he's doing something. Yeah, and the debate could be said to be that section in Castaway. It's like, what's going to happen? Yeah, how is this going to unfold? Where are we going? Okay, great. He lands on an island. He needs to survive, and I'm gonna fucking survive. So and they, I think it's says. it's the, the context matters a lot. He's on an island. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have much of a choice. Mm. So it makes sense that there wouldn't be a huge yeah. Ah, should I do this or should I not do this? I mean, for that story, it it makes sense that that's quite quick. Yeah. Of a moment where we then see him make that choice and start gathering items. But you could have a much longer. You could have a totally different story where the same thing happens, but the character is very different and would completely crumble under the pressure that's true and oh, just yeah. go and sit under a palm tree yeah. and cry yeah. and mourn their life yeah. and like give up and yeah. die mm -hmm. this character obviously isn't going to do that cool story that's a <laughs> yeah it wouldn't be a very interesting story um then we've got the break point six we've got break into act two which we've also gone over a few times yeah then the b story which we just talked about yeah then we've got the fun and games talked about the um delivery of the premise then point nine is the the midpoint stakes are raised mm -hmm. then we've got point 10 which is the bad guys closes in and let me just say that these points are all meant to be something that you can kind of remember mm -hmm. they have like a little ring to them or they yeah. put a picture in your mind yeah. obviously there's not always literal bad guys in films yeah you know not all films are about heroes and villains yeah that, as we think about like superheroes yeah. and supervillains. yeah it can often be just you know the someone's environment like in castaway the bad guys closes in are it was nature it's the thing that's going against the character's want yeah the major source of conflict yeah the, the antagonist it's like, it's, does that have to antagonistic be antagonistic force no yeah the force yeah. It doesn't have to be exactly like, there's no I, I, just, I meant if the word antagonist implies oh, right. a person no i've definitely heard okay. it used with force and then we've got the all is lost moment which is something we were actually just kind of debating before yeah. we started the podcast, which is kind of the lowest point for the character. Yeah. The point where he's furthest away from achieving his want. Where they feel, quote unquote, that all is lost. Yeah. Hmm. Also furthest away from achieving their need. Yes. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, the film with Jim Carrey called... Um, what is... Yes, man. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. The all is lost moment there is when he admits to his girlfriend that he's been saying yes because of this rule for the whole time. And he admits it because he has to say no finally for once. So he breaks the rule of the film and he isolates himself from his love interest. So at that point in the story, he's furthest away from what this entire mm. film is about. He's mm. lost the person who he's in love with and he's diverged in the complete opposite direction mm. from this idea of saying yes um because he literally says no I mean, it's such an obvious example of an all is lost moment okay um castaway all is lost moment wilson wilson rest in peace wilson! he loses you know his only friend he's out on the open ocean he's given up yeah the raft is falling apart the only th you know i consider wilson a person okay okay 
his only friend he loses you know it's yeah. the saddest moment ever i cry at that moment yeah it's not the saddest moment ever but it's very i i, I have never not cried at that scene. <laughs> uh it is so sad all is lost <laughs> Um, then we've got the Dark Knight of the Soul point twelve, which is a, a, an obvious following from the All Is Lost moment. Yeah. You can't just have All Is Lost and then boom climax. Yeah. You have to have this difficult segment where they really have to deal with this problem. Yeah, before they can get to a resolution. Yeah, which makes the climax so much more of a satisfying. Yeah, it's a much bigger payoff. Yeah. Before we get there, we've got point thirteen, which is the break into Act Three. Which is, you know, we've perfectly set up. The character is now dealing with the biggest problem they've dealt with yet. Mm -hmm. And point three, at point 13, break into act three is when they decide to do something about it. Specifically what they're going to do. Yeah. Ah, we're going to rescue Morpheus. We're going to make it all better. Yeah. And then you've got point 14, which here is like the finale, which I assume includes the climax. Obviously it must. Yeah. And the final point is the final image often mirroring the opening image yeah or contrasting yeah, or mirroring or contrasting to show how the characters changed yeah or how we came full circle or there's yeah. so many ways but the f opening and the final image are pretty huge especially in the way you remember the film yeah it's like the last little thing that you're left with so i have a question yeah when the when his wife and castaway yes doesn't come in the room to talk to him mm. i feel like there's a real down moment there mm -hmm. there's this expectation of I don't know. There's a tiny bit of hope that something will... It's the only person like he needs right now, right? And she has a new family and everything, and she doesn't even go in the room to talk to him. Yeah. And it sets up the climax of the movie. Yep. What is that? I'd say it's uh, part of the... Dark Knight of Dark the Soul. Dark Knight of the Soul, yeah. Yeah. Which specifically here says, protagonist has lost all hope. Yeah. Because that whole section of the film, I mean, we talk, we, we've talked about this. Yeah. Uh, when he gets rescued by the cargo ship, yeah. it's not a climactic moment at all. It's almost no. like a mysterious moment where you're yeah. thinking, well, what the hell's going to happen afterwards? Yeah. You're not going like, hooray, he's saved. He's yeah. not even celebrating. He's just sitting there completely emotionless. Yeah. Like, it almost doesn't matter. It's like he's mm. lost it. He's, you know, that's mm. kind of the feeling you have. And that mm. feeling carries on into the next many scenes yeah he's just kind of yeah. standing there like, what's the trigger for like he's just not really present yeah and he doesn't he doesn't react either you know when he sees his wife leaving because she doesn't see that he see he sees that yeah. she leaves he's just standing there uh -huh. looking you know he's not crying he's not going like i want to talk to you he's very emotionless and it shows just how much he's lost he's lost all hope right so how the fuck are we ever going to get out of this? It feels very much like, well, that's it. There's no way out. There's no happy ending, possibly. And then. Oh, ah. that's so good. I love that movie. Um, yeah, so those are all the points for, what's his name? Blake Snyder? Yeah. Um, there's also the hero's journey. I think his name is Joseph Campbell. Um, and there's also Dan Harmon's story circle. And then we've also talked about Sid Field's paradigm, and I think it's worth, you can also look up Aristotle's poetics. And I think it's worth people looking at all of these to kind of get a sense of- They're all variations know, they, they on all the same concept, other. right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I thought one thing just quickly that was super interesting that Tyler Morey said, um, he has a YouTube channel, you can go check him out, is when he's talking about Dan Harmon's story circle, it's this very simplified eight point um, structure to a story mm. and he's saying that you can remove certain elements of this eight point guide um but the more you for example um you could have a story where the character doesn't change at the end or you could have a story where the character doesn't get what they wanted or you could have a story where they don't return to a familiar situation in the end um but the the more you take away the less it becomes recognizable as a story. And that's Dan Harmon's point, that these eight points are things that we, as a, as a society, 
as humans recognize as stories mm. and that the, the more you skew away from something like that it's not that you can't do it and i think that's always the thing that you think you're so constrained by these points but that actually just your your story becomes less and less recognizable as a story the further you kind of stray away from it mm. which i think is cool and fine and like we always say you should just be aware of kind of the rules that you're breaking as opposed to just being ignorant or something i think we were saying that like a good story mirror mirrors real life and real life is filled with ups and downs yeah and that's ultimately kind of what this story structure is all about is yeah how can we kind of condense a real life experience into a story that someone else who doesn't know the person can relate to and can place themselves in that situation yeah. and imagine how they would feel what they would do yeah and it's just such a i don't know like think about something in your life that has any kind of significance to you yeah i'm sure if you really thought about it you could place that event or that part of your life yeah. into a very similar structure yeah where i'm sure too before you you know met the woman or man of your dreams volleyball you fucking had to deal with shit Mm -hmm. and it felt like you were never going to find someone yeah but even life is like that right yeah you want something you get what you wanted and there's another problem now yeah exactly there is no perfect i get to this point in life and i get what i wanted and we're done um, and then i could just commit suicide oh done there's always going to be a reverse side everything good has something bad hmm and that's what you want. You can't recognize good without bad. Yeah. If it's only good, you would have no... That would be your baseline. You wouldn't be able to know what it feels like to have anything good. Yeah, if you've never you been need... lonely, how are you going to appreciate relationships, a strong relationship? Yeah. Excuse me. But the interesting thing about film is that it often does feel like it wraps up nicely. And I think it's a bit of a magic trick. Isn't it kind of just like how we picture things that happen in our past? How so? Well, let me, let's use the example of the relationship thing. Yeah. That like you can kind of condense your thoughts to just one period of your life. Okay. And it's all, I feel like often when you think about the past, it's often like you think about it with, in a certain light. Mm -hmm. You can kind of... Yeah, you might. Once you met that person, that's the love of your life. Obviously, there's a you know years of relationships at a, a, a relationship after that where there's plenty of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. But there's still this feeling of like this story that ended on this climax. This like, but we did finally meet. Right. And like, all right, that's the story. Mm. You're not always left with. Very rarely are you left with like a. Yeah, but there were still many bad years to come. But ultimately, after that, they're still happy. I'm a little confused. Well, you were just saying that there's never a point in life where it's um, all good or all bad. It's constantly up and down, yeah. constantly flowing. I would agree. Yeah. But in film, you're often left with like a final like happy ending, you know? Oh. Or a bad ending. Right. But right. there is this feeling of finality within film yeah i think it's because it's the difference between the want and the need mm. the want is the sort of external thing that you think is gonna you know that is gonna have a flip side to it the need is something more once you've learned that valuable lesson or understood that yeah, it's a lesson thing. and you can learn a lesson i don't think there's a negative to learning a lesson no but the want is more something i want to be the ceo of this company yeah you become ceo and i guarantee you there's going to be something right that's good that's a good way of looking at it same with relationships like once i've found the person mm -hmm. then yeah obviously there's plenty of other things that are going to happen negative and positive yeah. to do with that relationship yeah. but the ultimate story there was the finding the person mm -hmm. yeah what, what time are we at here 52 i 52. think that's perfect Oh, we could do the Joker if you want. No, I was just going to talk about character arcs. Hmm. K. 
character arcs are another tool that can be really useful mm. to think about what's the arc that my character is going to go through. Um, because if, if we hadn't made it clear, it's you can't have a story where nothing happens. I mean, that sounds obvious. Yes. But you need to have your character, either they are changing or they are changing something in the world. Yeah. And so you, from that logic, you have three kind of baseline character arcs. You've got a positive change arc, but the char- character starts in a negative place and ends up in a positive place, mm-hmm. has learned something good. Or you've got a negative change arc, which is fun- opposite. funnily enough, the opposite. Yeah. And then you've got a flat arc, which is where the character themselves don't actually change that much. They have a very... Um, consistent uh, either set of values or morals or their actions are very consistent. Yeah, They already know the thing that they need to know but they actually change the world around them. Yeah, A good example of that would be like Forrest Gump. Yeah, He's very much, you know, Forrest Gump is Forrest Gump. He doesn't have to learn anything. Mm -hmm. I know what love is. He knows that from the beginning and so he actually changes the world around Mm. him. Mm. Other people need to learn a lesson. Mm. He's the one to initiate that. You've also got uh, other flat arc characters like a lot of like the early James Bond films. Mm. Like he's this macho character who you know he's not he's not very yeah he doesn't go at the end. Huh, maybe I should treat women better. Yeah, no, he's the same in the beginning as he is in the end. Yeah, you know? but he often saves you know saves the world or you know captures the bad guy. Yeah, and other people, minor characters go through valuable lessons um i would say for james bond that that is very different in some of the newer james bonds which is yeah, why they bit, stand out as yeah. different a lot of people have said oh this doesn't really feel like james bond because he's like he cares about a woman he falls in love with someone oh, and what a little bitch <laughs> uh you've also got like oh 12 angry men the main yeah. character yeah it doesn't change he's got a firm that's belief like the perfect example he changes everyone yeah around him that's such a good movie flat arcs then you've got we were talking about positive character arcs you've got that's like the typical hero story it's yeah a positive change arc. like yeah. harry potter yeah or star wars or the grinch yeah that's a very good one um like most i'd say like 80 percent of films follow that mm that kind of uh, structure mm. a positive change arc mm. but then you've also got the negative change arc which we've had a little bit of a discussion about because it can be a little confusing oh yeah well the negative being the opposite of that somebody who gets corrupted um somebody who um starts a scarface you know Starts a Scarface. I mean, Scarface is an example. Oh, yeah, yeah. Scarface is an example. Yeah, they're um, uh, they 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 rise to power, but ultimately at the end, yeah, what's they what lose it? everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, it can have a lot of the traits of a positive change arc, but it's very important in in understanding the end. Yeah, of the film. Um, so we were. There's kind of like three subcategories within the negative change arc that I I've at least came come across a okay. few times which you you mentioned one of them which is the corruption arc mm-hmm. and there's like the fall arc yeah which you could say is something like breaking bad follows the fall arc yeah it's kind of like a rise is to corruption like just a very specific i guess there's a lot of movies where people get corrupted yeah okay like the godfather yeah where michael is very against everything that his family's doing yeah. any part of it yeah and slowly he gets lured in and yeah. he starts to see a lot of it's kind of like the Irishman is a bit of a corruption arc, eh? Yeah, I think maybe a lot of like gangster mob films. movies, yeah, mob <laughs> films. And by the end, he's he is the Godfather, yeah. and he totally embraces it. Yeah, you know, he's yeah, not reluctant yeah. about it. Yeah, uh, it's a corruption arc. Yeah. Um. So got like the Great Gatsby. Is kind of like a fall arc. Mm. You know, the Great Gatsby. You could look at it. It depends on who you're looking yeah. at the character being. Are you talking about the Great Gatsby? Or are you talking about Nick Carraway? Exactly. Um, but I think in both cases it's a negative change arc. But I think it would depend on whether it's a disillusionment arc, which is the final What's that? subcategory. I think that's something like uh, like The Great Gatsby, or you think the main character thinks they know something, 
And by the end of the film, that turns out not to be true. Uh, so like the great Gatsby, okay. um, you know, by the end of the film, you know, he, he has this He's proven wrong. romantic notion of what both he can do and what, 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 what is real. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out not to be true at all. Mm. You know, m- money and power do not really mean anything at the end of the day. Mm. I think Nick Carraway kind of goes through the same change. He, in a lot of ways, believes that. He's the character. I don't know how well you know the story, but I've seen the new Great Gatsby so many times. Mm. And it's very much and it's seen through Nick Carraway's eyes. He's the main character. And he is, you know, so enticed by this world of glamour and parties yeah. and you know the rich are you know it's the best yeah and by the end it's all all that has changed he doesn't believe that at all you know they're all the the worst yeah. people in the world i think i just read somewhere that it was a it's a growth arc i don't want to get into it because i didn't read too much but it's like he believes a lie at the beginning and he he becomes a better person for it kind of towards the end you know you learn something yeah it doesn't have a very happy ending it's not like he's like oh yeah nice yeah i think it, it, with all of these something is learned yeah yeah, I mean, yeah maybe yeah. that should be clear yeah that's true but i think character arcs are interesting because they really influence specifically the ending of your story and when i was writing my last film i really struggled to know well how i wanted to end it yeah and the character arcs in the book uh, called creating character arcs by i don't remember her name okay. uh K.M. Wyland, I believe. Put it right here. Yeah, she'll be in the description. Um, that really helped me understand, well, my story can kind of be the same up until Act 3 and then very dramatically change in, in Act 3. You can have very different films yeah. Yeah. based on what they end up doing in the end. You know, Do they learn the lesson that they were that was set up for them? We were saying yesterday, it really feels like that's your opinion kind of Mm, it's what you're trying to say it's where all the meaning kind of comes from yeah or just like yeah you change a film's ending Mm. you know you change clockwork orange's ending Mm. and suddenly you have a whole different meaning kind of of course yeah and that's your interest it's kind of what the writer was trying to i don't know it feels like there's a message in there somewhere yeah um (laughs) It's interesting. Let's look at like Frodo and Lord of the Rings. Or let's let's do. I don't know that one that well. Even though yeah. I just watched it. Uh, let's do it. I think I can do that. He at the very end, the whole thing has been leading up to him throwing the ring into yeah. more into the fires of uh, Mount Doom. Yeah. He's standing there. Yeah. He got the option. Yeah. We already know that the person who had the option before him, thousands of years earlier, didn't throw the ring in there. Yeah. And what does he do? Can't do it. He doesn't throw it in there. He's corrupted by the ring. Yeah. That says Which a lot. It, it it gives you the whole theme of the film. Yeah, shows you how my powerful opinion. this thing really is. Yeah, that or like how the importance of like banding together. Yeah, because he can't or do it by relying himself. on other people. And the whole thing has been about Trusting him doing people. it. Yeah, he's the only one who can bear the ring. No one can help him. Yeah, the right? power the of friendship. End, almost he has to have his friend help him yeah. because he can't bear the bear the load, load by himself. Yeah, um, yeah, super powerful scene. Even. Um, Let's think about Castaway. I feel like it w- it's it's just such a different movie if he doesn't see that girl at the end. Yeah, there's no hope. No. He needs that last scene. Because it almost says... He learned his lesson. It almost says, like, time heals all. You know? It leaves you with this... Ooh! That is what feeling, it's about, isn't it? You know? Time heals all. Because time is such a huge... Metaphor. Or not yeah. metaphor, like, it's like a character. Yeah. Almost. Or if he just died on the island. The tide is turning. You know, suddenly you'd be like, oh, he really should have been more, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, you, could, uh, you could make that a movie. You can make a million movies out yeah, of that same yeah. plot. You, That's the thing. I think it, it really, it really. He could get back together with his wife at the end. Yeah. And it would be like, oh, it's good. You know, I survived. It's the whole Yeah, film. imagine that. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah, he comes back. She's been waiting for him the whole time. The whole time. Yay. Yeah. It would just, mm wouldn't be as good lack a little bit of flavor a little bit of depth yeah 
Very true. Um, so maybe that's not actually the thing. Maybe there is just a, a better way to, you, you know, better way to tell a story sometimes. It, it's not it, necessarily the writer's yeah. opinion. It's right. like, no, this is, might just be the most interesting. Right, yeah, that's good. It, 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 looking at character arcs, at least for me, was a way to explore different ways that the story could go. Yeah. Because sometimes you have it very stuck in your head that, oh, it's definitely going to happen this way. Yeah, yeah. Like, they're definitely going to get what they want at the end. But what if you don't give them that? What yeah. does that suddenly say? Exactly. Oh, my God, it says all these things that I'm actually so much more interested in exploring. I hadn't even thought of those. Yeah, yeah. What if at the very end they get what they want, and it turns out that that wasn't what they wanted at all. And well, it's that's been the clear midpoint. the whole time. <laughs> and you got suddenly, another 60 pages to write. Yeah. No, and, or you're left with a feeling of, oh my God, like, yeah. I should have seen that coming. Yeah. Yeah. It can suddenly be a very sad ending to what actually should have been a happy ending. And I think it, it, it also is, uh, we were talking about the Joker. You know, the way it ends really upset people. Mm. because it feels like you're glorifying it a little bit right not a little bit i think you're glorifying it but it's the best story i think so i so wasn't offended i almost i immediately take it back on like it's your opinion okay you know i don't think that's always the case no. i think in, in a lot of cases that would be the case like the film you're writing now with avalanche yeah i think it says a little bit about you how you choose to end the film you know, yeah. looking at it that way but then i also think there might just be a best. There might be a more interesting way. Way for the actual story itself. Yeah. yeah. Gets something deeper by ending it a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've tried to cover this massive topic as well as we could in in you know a relatively short time. Yeah. I mean, this is stuff that like. We might. A lot of books have been written on. It's a huge topic. There's so much to debate. There's so many different interpretations. But we were just trying to like explore how much you can actually do before you start writing. There's so many things that you can yeah. think about in terms of structure to give you a better chance at really creating something new and interesting. And we're both in the process of writing, I think, and it, it even just helps to go over everything again yeah you i don't, think it's something that's there's so much information it's a constant thing right yeah that it's really helpful just to go over it and i noticed when you do something like this and you go over it just how many ideas pop into your yeah, head yeah, when you're just sure. looking at like oh that would be an interesting midpoint for this story or yeah. i don't know there's something like a fire gets lit where you're like it's a great tool to get out of writer's block yeah for sure look at some story structure uh books and videos and suddenly yeah. you'll be like oh my god i hadn't even thought of doing that or yeah. what if i introduced this or what if i had set that up in the beginning yeah well, let me go back and do that and suddenly you've got a whole new thing that you can start getting into yeah it's a very interesting topic you um, want me to give you one question on the joker okay hmm hmm I think the, the what's the midpoint? What's the midpoint of the Joker? Yeah. And this is I'm basing this off of the beach. Save sheets. the Cat has a website where you can check out beat points of various movies. The midpoint. Can I get a few guesses? Because it's hard to remember yeah. exactly when they're when these things happen. It's really hard to do. The first when you thing have that, that pops into my mind mm -hmm. is when he's dancing on the stairs. Does that come a lot later? Yeah, it's a lot later. Okay, that comes a lot later. Um, is it when he sees the TV show? He imagines the TV show where the host is making fun of him. It's. Does he imagine that? Yeah, he imagines himself on the TV show when he's standing in the hospital room. Right, but he's only on the show once. Yeah, but he's on the show. The clip of him from the nightclub is on the show. Yes, that that's the midpoint. Yeah, well, he doesn't imagine it's on the show. Yeah, but he imagines being there and yeah, yeah, yeah. standing up and. Is that the same clap. scene though? No, no, you're that's right. I'm mixing scene. them up. I'm mixing them up. Yeah, so <clears> the part where he gets made fun of by the character. Yeah, by because he gets what he wanted. He's on TV. Yeah, and then immediately right. you have the reversal of the situation where he's right. starting to be made fun of, 
and the stakes are fucking raised because you get a yeah. serious feeling of like, yeah. oh shit, what's gonna happen now? It does show you how clear it's like, yeah, it's exactly what he wanted. Yeah. But not really. He wouldn't have a story if it was yeah. like Boom, he gets on the show. Yeah. And it was perfect. Exactly. All right, well I feel pretty happy with my answer. That was good. Yeah. Cool. Impressive. Um, well, we will be back with another episode of the Burning Boat Show next week. See you then. Bye.